everybody is sure he or she wants to stay. I don't know how many of you believe that the Higgs boson was the discovery of the century, but what is sure that Einstein, Dirac or Schrödinger would have considered this discovery as ridiculous. They would never have believed that such a model with so many unexplained parameters reflecting anything fundamental. So I'm going to argue that particle physics as practiced since 1930 is a futile enterprise in its entirety. We shall uh, look more in detail. I think there are seven deadly sins of particle physics. First of all, overwhelming complication. Good physics is simple. And the true revolutions in physics always simplify the laws of nature. Maxwell's electrodynamics was a revolution because the electrodynamic constants and the speed of light were condensed in one formula, eliminating one constant of nature. So did the Planck constant H simplify the laws of nature. And Newton's theory of gravitation condensed dozens of unexplained parameters into one gravitational constant. Particle physics is going the other way around. It produced 17, 20, more than 50 free parameters if you count the masses. So, um, I always hear that the standard model is a tremendous simplification, okay? But only because a nonsensical production of particles had taken place in the 1960s. Sorry, but who believed that hundreds of elementary particle could reflect anything fundamental if you think about the elementary laws of nature. So the progress in particle physics is like two steps back and one step forward. I don't think this is real progress. Even more irritating, the suppression of basic problems. None of the great riddles that have bothered the founding fathers of physics have solved to this day. And please don't tell me that the Higgs boson says something about the origin of mass. We don't understand the mass ratio of proton and electron, 1836, and now we understand it's a ratio of couplings to the Higgs field. I think it's better for physics not to have such kind of progress. To summarize, the standard model says nothing about the contradictions of electrodynamics. It says nothing about how to compute masses. It says nothing how to compute mass ratios. Nothing about lifetimes. Nothing about the fine structure constant. Nothing about the relation to gravity. Nothing about the origin of spin of radioactivity. Nothing about the nature of space, time, and inertia. A model that says nothing about all these fundamental questions is crap. How did it all came about? After the groundbreaking findings of the last, at the beginning of the last century, around 1930, physics, physicists changed from understanding to describing. They gave up understanding and they started to describe nature. This was a paradigm shift and that's where the search for the fundamental laws of nature stopped and it transformed into the high-tech the, the high sports we practice to this day. If you read Thomas Kuhn, it's pretty clear that science does not work this way. The steady increase of science and the increase of anomalies leads always to a crash, but never to a true breakthrough. I think we have symptoms of a Kuhnian crisis in physics. This may seem pretty general as an argument, so I will become, I try to become more concrete. The motto of particle physics is yesterday's Nobel Prize is today's background. That's the way it works, somebody told me. I think this is a thoroughly foolish strategy. It's thoroughly foolish because if you do enough triggering, filtering, and removing backgrounds, there is always a signal left. Okay? And 
I think, by the way, there is, there is pretty much reason to suspect that by doing all this filtering, triggering, and uh, analyzing data on the computational levels, there might be artifacts affecting the analysis. I cannot prove that. Who can? So let's assume for the moment that everything is done properly, everything is under control, the backgrounds are removed properly, and um, everything works fine. Then still the whole enterprise is a foolish strategy. Because going to higher energies, producing more data, filtering more extensively, and uh, measuring tinier and tinier signals is a process that may continue infinitely. I think it's a hamster wheel, and it has turned several times in the history of particle physics. And it seems that it continues to turn. And I always wonder because why, why people don't re realize how much theoretical assumptions enter the back door of these so-called experiments. I mean, we are declaring banal signals of two extra photons as a Higgs boson, and what you call a W boson is, is essentially a fast electron and something that is missing. That's bizarre. No top quark and no W boson has ever seen a detector because they don't live long enough. And it's bizarre also the underlying theoretical model. Physics, for 100 years, physicists don't understand the beta decay, how the proton transforms into the neutron. We call this nicely isospin. And we don't really understand the relation of, weak, of the weak interaction to the str uh, strong interaction. And we have invented a term that is called strangeness. But can anybody in the room explain to me how these two entirely, entirely metaphorical terms happen to be the axis of a coordinate system about all the reasoning about symmetries is based? I think this is pretty bizarre. God created everything by number, weight, and measure. Particle physics doesn't predict any number anyway. We have isospin, we have strangeness, we have bottomness, we have topness. But to call objects with these labels, particles, just psychologically displaces how much distance one has from reason. To call these particles. I think that any reasonable scientist has to have some doubts about the model. But obviously, there is one good argument in favor of the standard model. Thousands of physicists would not deal with a theoretical model of reality if it was baloney. And I bet that, unconsciously, this is the strongest argument you have for the standard model. And it's profoundly flawed. It has been disproved many times in history. Because in big communities, there is groupthink. Just think about economics. And I think also this business has to become too big to fail. So let me skip this and just one of my favorite common opinions I like to challenge the standard model is precisely tested. It's interesting, if you ask five different people, you get five different answers what the most precise test is. There is no precision in particle physics. The detector has a precision of 6%. And this is a poor accuracy. Even if you do your best, I don't deny that, even if you do your best, it's a poor accuracy with respect to many other fields of physics. And no precision test whatsoever will come out of that. And we are going to, uh, what we're going to discover next, or oh, maybe the next accelerator, second, third, or Susie Higgs, or versions of lighter supersymmetric particle, fourth quark generation, and so on. Mini black holes, extra dimensions, gravity on your face. That's what the string theory sect tells you. 
I don't think this is science. Actually, you're predicting that your next collider will show something. But I tell you something. True science, the true discovery, sooner or later has always transformed into useful technology. There would be no digital cameras without quantum mechanics, no cell phones without Maxwell, and no GPS receiver working without Einstein's general relativity. But there is no way even to think about the useful application of a W boson or Higgs or a quark. <laughs> no, I'm not joking, I'm not making this up. Because it would be a real independent test. But this model hasn't proved, hasn't justified its usefulness and its correctness outside the narrow field of the academic environment. And this is a problem. Mr. Unziger, yeah, I think, I think at this point we, are, it's, we risk to, to walk into pseudoscience. So that's what, what Bruce G. Carlton calls zombie science that may be kept alive by endless transfusions of cash and technology. And I think that as fundamental questions are regarded, the money, the money is wasted at the moment. Come up with an alternative, Mr. Unsiga, before you criticize. That's always what I hear. But sorry, it's impossible. Because the results are phrased in a language that anticipates the notion of the, the, notion of the, of the model. And I think that really nobody can overthrow the complexity of, of the experiment. There's no way to check the results. And there is not a single bubble chamber photography, not a single collision data of which anyone outside the community can make sense. That has to be on the internet. And the fact that it's not, it's a scandal in the 21st century. And of course, there are two objections. First of all, no, 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 you have to be an expert to understand the data. Um, we have to be an expert to understand the data, and uh, these data are detector dependent. No. The laws of nature are not detector dependent, and it's your business to make it transparent, accessible, and formulate in a language which is without prejudice. Second objection, we do our best, but we can't, ha we can't handle more data. It's impossible. There's not enough disk space, even if you pile up the DVDs on, on top of them, of the Alps. Okay, sorry, but who told you to build an experiment too big, which produces way more data than can reasonably be analyzed? Sorry, but whose fault is it that collider physics has grown to a nonsensical size? You don't have enough disk space, so let's be more humble. Put the LAP data on the internet. Put the Gargamel data on the internet. Just go back in history until you have enough disk space. Okay? I would love to see the Gargamel data. I would love to see the DC data. I would love to see Ledermann's neutrino experiment on the internet. I would love to see Hofstetter's collision experiment. If not, to anyone else, I think this is your business to the taxpayer. You owe to the taxpayer. Thanks for your patience. <laughs> Any comments? I mean, you're perfectly correct. That's how science actually works. And that's how it's described by Thomas Kuhn. 
because people tend to collect data to, to, uh, uh, to fit their parameters to the data, but um, it's not that the true progress, the true, true progress is, is in here. Think about geocentric astronomy. Think about the epicycles. Think about how many parameters those guys collected. And it was not the progress in refining the epicycles that led to a physics revolution, but it was some guy who thought that the planets might turn around the sun and not the Earth. Yes, but without epicycles and finding first the epicycles and then finding finer, finer uh, versions of the epicycles and finding finding out more and more and finding out conflicts. But without the epicycle, that wouldn't have been the progress in the sense that another model would have come up. Because you first have to have, have the current model and bring it to its borders, and then you can have this progress that you need. But without, if you find the first model that you have, then there is no progress at all, because you have to start from something. Yeah, first of all, yeah. first thing, first thing, I don't, I don't believe that you really create the anomalies. These are all buried in some tension that will probably soon drop out, but there is no really tension, no really problem created. I don't think that the standard model is falsifiable. There is no result that could not be digested by some neat extension. This is the first thing. And the second thing is, I mean, if you're happy working on the happy cycles, let it be. It's okay. That's how science is done. <laughs> so, thank you.